Hello everybody and welcome. This is Adrian. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's going to be time for some Victoria 2. This is our Victoria 2 tutorial series as the Empire of Brazil. In the last episode, we just got done with production, budget, and technology. Now we're going to be progressing on to politics. <clears throat> okay, so political screen. There's a lot here. Don't worry. It's not too bad. Don't worry. Okay, so in this left column is basically your legislature and what type of government you have. So we have a constitutional monarchy. We have what is called a national value. So every country in the world has a sort of national value. Usually some things, some countries in the, in like the new world, for example, have things like liberty or equality as national values, um, more autocratic states, or for example, Japan, Japan has a tradition national value. So tradition is really, really important to the Japanese people and to the Japanese nation. And so each of these national values have specific sort of, of effects, I guess you could say, or modifiers that are specific to that national value. So our national value here as the Empire of Brazil is equality. So we have assimilation rate, social reform desire, immigration attraction, mobilization size, mobilization impact, pop militancy, and culture tech research plus 5%. So basically people will want more social reform. They will want to come to Brazil more often. We can raise a larger army by mobilizing our, our, uh, our conscripts. We have uh, less militancy. So we have a less unrest. We research culture tech more quickly and we assimilate pops quicker. We'll get into culture a little later. Uh, okay. And then as a constitutional monarchy, you can uh, appoint the ruling party. So here, this, this is your upper house, right? So this is, this is your, you know, your Senate in Brazil under the empire of Brazil's constitution. There were a lower house, which was a popularly elected chamber of deputies. And then there was the upper house, which is the Senate and the legislature itself was called the general assembly. So this here screen is your upper house, your Senate. You can choose the ruling party of your Senate. Right now, we have 60% conservative, 25% liberal, and 15% reactionary. This is the Partido Conservador, which is the conservative party. It shows all your different policies that you can, um, that you have when it comes to things like factories. It could, you know, tell you, like, can your investors build foreign railways? Can you build factories yourself? Can you expand factories, close factories, things like that? <laughs> So we have uh, here, these are, the, these are the stances of the political party. These are their positions on certain things. So our trade policy is protectionism. So we like tariffs, basically. Uh, your economic policy is interventionism. In general, this is a free market economy, but the government reserves the right to intervene within national interest requires. So it costs, imports cost more, but you're, you know, you, you're allowed to intervene in factories. You can subsidize factories, things like that. Uh, religious policy, there's a couple different types. Right now we have pluralism. There is a state religion and the state religion is actively promoted, but other religions are tolerated. So, you know, if you have say Catholics and Protestants, if you have a pluralist religious policy, Catholics will be kind of happy, but you know, Protestants aren't too persecuted, you know, so they're, they're kind of okay. They're tolerated, um, to the greatest degree that they can be. Anyway, you have a citizenship policy. So usually there's residency, limited citizenship, or full citizenship. Here we have limited citizenship. So basically the higher you get in citizenship, the greater your assimilation rate. So residency is basically there is no real assimilation of foreign cultures. Limited citizenship is kind of a timid assimilation rate. And then full citizenship is there's a lot of citizenship. So, um, you know, like say a reactionary party would have basically residency as, as it's, as it's citizenship policy. Whereas usually when you get into more liberal parties, you'll see either limited citizenship or full citizenship. Um, a lot of stuff in South America is a little interesting that a lot of liberal parties actually still only have residency as their citizenship policy. So it's kind of curious. Um, and then we have a war policy. So basically, how do you view the military? There is either anti-military or pacifism, or on the other side, there's jingoism. Jingoism is like a super, super militaristic state. The military is the centerpiece of the state. Military spending is prioritized. So right now we're jingoist. So we have supply consumption plus 10%, um, but our, our military is really, really good. We're really, really good at fighting war. 
And then in HFM, specifically in HFM, there is a thing called welfare policy. Um, you don't have to worry about it too much, but welfare policy is basically, do you like welfare or not? So most, most countries don't really have an official welfare policy. Some parties, for instance, uh, usually fascist parties have a paternalistic welfare policy is that they actually do have welfare policies and they actually are quite involved in welfare for their people, but they do it from a paternalistic sort of, um, position. It's more so, you know, the government is the centerpiece of the state of the people. We're going to help you, but you have to be loyal to the government. Um, other places, usually liberal democracies, maybe like the United States later on in the game, will have a very, very uh, liberal welfare policy just because they like, you know, welfare, like a, a welfare state, you know, um, very reminiscent of like liberal policies during the 1900s, you know, so, but, but most countries won't have an official welfare policy. Some, some parties will, but like here, we actually don't have any sort of welfare policy whatsoever for any of these parties. So, you know, down here we have two types of, um, ideologies kind of like baselines or kind of public opinion measurements of public opinion you have the ideology of your people and the ideology uh, ideology of your voters so here most of our voters are conservative most of our people however are still conservative but a lot of them are actually liberal the thing is is your population of voters is not the same as your population of people so you gotta you gotta keep that in mind um, especially when you want to hold elections See, we can see here, we can, we can see a prediction of who is likely to be a ruling party. Our next election is January 1st, 1840. Usually elections are every four years. You can hold them earlier if you want, though, if you want a certain party in power. But, I mean, since we're a constitutional monarchy, monarchies get to choose their ruling parties. Republican forms of government do not, so you got to keep that in mind. Dictatorships usually have one set party that can't be changed, usually. And then down here we have what are called issues. So you can you can sort between voters on what their issues are and you can sort between the people what their issues are. So I can click over here for the people and 26.43% of the people are concerned with freedom of the womb, right? With with um making the children of slaves free free born. Only 3.09% of the voters are concerned with that. Voters are actually concerned with our jingoism policy. So just something to keep in mind. And then these here, these are all of your reforms. You can have social reforms, political reforms, and then matters of state. So these are all policies. These are all political reforms. Basically, they change your draft laws, your political parties, your upper house, what it consists of, trade unions, centralization, your type of government. You can go from totalitarianism, which is, you know, no limits on government authority. And then you have the unitary system, which is central government is ultimately supreme. Federalism is there's division between the federal government and state governments uh regionalism is i actually don't see regionalism too much you'll, you'll see it in places like the middle east and stuff middle east central asia kind of around there uh confederalism is a very very weak confederacy uh i'm not sure if you'll actually see any, any confederations either maybe in something like switzerland maybe but confederalism you won't see too much and then totalitarianism usually is, is with revolutions, either communist revolutions or fascist revolutions, usually. Vote franchise, voting system, public meetings, slavery, press rights, colonial policy, debt law. All this we're going to talk about a little later in the game. It's not necessary to know them right now. They're kind of self-explanatory anyway. You either have no minimum wage, good minimum wage, no health care, good health care, you know, things like that. Uh, movements are... Either political movements, you know, movements for reforms, movements for revolutions. You can see rebel organizations here. Terrorist organizations will pop up here. Um, maybe later in the game we'll get a little more into that. Obviously, we have decisions. We can see there's plenty of decisions to go through. We're not going to go through them all right now, but decisions are just, you know, kind of um, special decisions that you can you can have for your country. Um, usually flavor flavor events and things like that is what you'll see here. And then you have a release nations button. You can release certain countries to be satellites of your country. You lose infamy when you do that. We'll talk about infamy a little later. And the last thing I want to mention is two, two modifiers up here. There's something called plurality and revanchism. So revanchism, which is French for revenge, is a yearning for the return of land lost to the nation. Basically, when your country uh, has cores that are occupied or controlled by other nations. So we have cores in Paraguay. Uh, there's some uncolonized land here, and then we have the Rio Grande do Sul as cores of the Empire of Brazil. We have revanchism because of that. 
So revanchism usually increases your jingoism policy. Is that the more revanchism you have, the more people are going to be jingoist in nature. Plurality is a level of they say shared consciousness, but it it really basically means a level of like liberalism in your country. If there's no plurality, there's no liberal discussion, there's no real liberal debate. And so your people aren't necessarily all that conscious of things like freedom and liberty and stuff like that. If you have 100% literacy, that means that you're in a very, very pluralistic society. There's a lot of debate, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of partisanship, things like that. The higher your plurality, the more likely people are to be liberal. The less your plurality, the less likely people are to be liberal. As the game progresses, plurality will usually increase to 100%. The thing is, is with plurality, is it increases your research points. So the more liberal you are, the more discussion, the more consciousness there is in your country, the faster you generate research points. On the other hand, the more liberal your people are, the more likely they are to become, you know, socialist, communist, the more they want social reforms, the more upset they become, all sorts of stuff. So you got to keep plurality in mind as well as revenge. Revanchism isn't too big of a deal. Plurality is kind of a big deal. So you got to keep it in mind. Okay. That's it for politics. We're not going to go through any decisions right now. We'll go through them later. Let's go for population. So population is exactly what it sounds. It's a breakdown of all the adult male population in your country. So these are all of our pops. You can actually hover over and see how many pops you have. See, we have like 29,000 soldiers, we have 860,000 farmers, 65,000 uh, 65, laborers. Um, our most populous state is uh, Rio de Janeiro, 336,000 adult males. Our least populous state is Goiás, which is only 16,000. You'll also see like colonies and stuff here. And I can click on the Empire of Brazil as a whole and I can see, you know, in our workforce of the Empire of Brazil, we have like 54% farmers, right? Most of our people are Catholic. Most were conservative. The electorate vote, many of our voters are conservative, 87%. Um, some of the dominant issues is the freedom of the womb law. So people want slaves born to, or children born to slave women to be freeborn. And then we can see culture. Most of our culture is either Brazilian or Afro-Brazilian, and a little bit Amazonian, and then there's 1.4% minority. If I want maybe a specific demographic breakdown, I can actually click on individual provinces that belong to a state or just the state itself. And just see individual breakdowns all at once. And as far as the pops, I can actually deselect all my pops and say, hey, I just want to look at the soldiers. Who are my soldiers? What do they look like? So most of our soldiers are Brazilian. Some are Afro-Brazilian. All of them are Catholic, basically. And most of them are very, very conservative. I can come over here to, say, the landowners, right? The landowners are uh, very conservative. A couple reactionaries, a couple liberals, mostly Catholic. And most of them are Brazilian. Or I want to take a look at uh, officers. You know, officers are actually a little more conservative or um, a little more reactionary and liberal than some of the other pops. Almost all of them are Catholic and a hundred percent of our officer corps is Brazilian. Interesting. You know, so that's just, that's just the population system. That's how you look around. Now there are these things called national foci or national focus. You generate the national focus is basically your focus for your country if you want something certain to happen. So say right now, I want to boost our administrative efficiency in all of our states. Well, to do that, we need more bureaucrats, right? So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna select, hey, Rio de Janeiro, I'm gonna put a national focus here. I want to encourage bureaucrats. And you'll see here, encouragement for bureaucrats is gonna increase 20%. We're gonna do that. Let's go for Bahia. We're gonna do the same thing. So we're going to encourage bureaucrats in these two states, which will boost our administrative spending or our administrative, excuse me, our administrative efficiency. Okay. Um, there's, a, there's a few more options for national foci. You can encourage any one of these sort of sorts of pop promotions, you know, um, you can encourage the production of certain factories. You can encourage certain party loyalties that can make people more conservative, more reactionary, more liberal. Um, I can encourage immigration. I can attract immigrants from, say, Europe to come to this state. Or I could want people to leave this state to go to our colonies. And then there's colonial policies here. And that's it for population, really. Um, there's, there's two other factors here. There is militancy and consciousness. So militancy is how pissed off people are. The more militancy, the more likely you're going to have rebel movements, terrorist movements, um, things like that. 
And then consciousness is basically the, the discourse of your people, the awareness of political issues of your people. The higher your consciousness, the more people are going to be kind of um, educated on political issues, you know. So as your consciousness will rise, these dominant issues in our country will change. They'll, you know, vary from person to person. High consciousness, high militancy usually means you're going to have a lot of rebel movements, a lot of terrorist movements, things like that. Ideally, you want both of these to be low. You, want, you don't want people involved in the political process. You don't want people involved in terrorist organizations or revolutions, things like that. But it happens. It happens. Okay. So trade is a big one. Trade. This screen might look a little a little daunting, but it's really not that bad. You have four, four types of goods. You have got industrial goods, raw materials, consumer goods, military goods. You need these for your army. You need these for your people. You need these for your industry. And you need these also for your industry, but also for your people. Um, you can see what you need. You can see your government need, your factory need, your population need here. And market activity, you can see, like, are people trying to produce more ammunition? Is ammunition more expensive? You can see your stockpile, how much you have in your stockpile for your country that you need. So am I stockpiling, you know, ammunition? Am I selling artillery? Things like that. And then you have what's called a common market. A common market. I'm going to go over here to the sphere of influence map mode. Let's go take a look at the British sphere of influence, the United Kingdom. So the United Kingdom has Belgium and Hanover in the British sphere of influence. They also have all of India, Nepal, um, the Konbuang dynasty, uh, the Trusil states, Australia, uh, a little bit down here, a little bit down here in... Um, yeah, was this Malaya? I guess we'd call it. So there's a thing called the sphere of influence, and a sphere of influence basically is, as the name kind of implies, the influence of a country in the world. So the United Kingdom, with all these little countries, Belgium, Hanover, India, those countries are in the British sphere of influence, which means they're a part of the British common market. So all these little countries. In Malaya, India, the Trucial States, Belgium, Hanover, they get access to the British Empire's market before anybody else does. Now, there's good things and bad things for that. It's good because that makes goods inherently cheaper, right? You don't have to pay tariffs. You don't have to, you know, get in a trade war or a price war or race to the bottom with other countries. You get to buy British goods, British produced goods, British sphere of influence goods before any other country. So Belgium can buy British goods before the Prussians can because they're in the same common market. The bad thing is, is that Belgium's goods are included in that market, in that common market. So the United Kingdom can buy Belgian goods before anybody else can, and Belgium can buy British goods before anybody else can. So a country like Belgium might want Tariffs, for instance, might want to encourage tariffs to make some money for the government. When they're sphered by the British, however, because of the power of the Brits, how many goods they have, they produce literally anything that the Belgian people could need. The Belgian government would no longer have any tariff revenue because the Belgian people would never import goods from Prussia. They would never import anything from Austria or France. They would literally be able to buy everything they need from the United Kingdom or dom uh, domestically produced, you would never get any tariff revenue. So there's there's advantages and disadvantages to being in a common market in a sphere of influence. Ideally, you want to have your own sphere of influence. So like as Brazil, we want to have all of South America in our sphere of influence. Nobody can mess with our common market or our sphere of influence. Ideally, ideally. On the other hand, if we were to be sphered by British or by the by Britain, we would gain access to all of the common market of the United Kingdom, which is quite a bit of goods, which means our people will generally be better off. They'll be able to buy goods cheaply, save more money, live better, Walmart, you know, that kind of thing. So that's that's the common market. Your common market will, will show up here. Um, we'll show what kind, of, what kind of goods you have, you know. So as you can see right now, because we're not in anybody's sphere of influence, our common market, say for our top five goods, is the exact same as what we produce because we produce our top five produced goods, our coffee, lumber, regular clothes, tobacco, furniture, and our common market 
has these five goods at the top as well. As we maybe get sphered by somebody or we create our own sphere of influence, we're going to have a different common market. So that's how trade works. All the buying and selling of goods is automatic. Don't really do it manually. I don't, I don't, I don't mess with it manually. The game will figure it out on its own. It's just the best way for the game to run is just let price and price, supply and demand do its thing. Low supply, high demand, price increases, high supply, low demand, price will decrease. Ideally, you want an equilibrium where the supply and demand are exactly the same. And so everybody gets exactly as much as they want. It never happens, but that's the point, you know? Okay. Diplomacy. <clears throat> so diplomacy, really basic. You've got wars, war justifications, which is basically you forming Cassus Belize against other countries. Cassus Belize means a case for war. And then great powers gives you the eight great powers of the world. There are three types of powers, minor powers, secondary powers, great powers. And then basically uncivilized powers are basically, you know, minor powers. So the UK is number one in the world. The Russians are second. The Kingdom of France is third. Austrians are fourth. Prussians are fifth. Spanish are sixth. Americans are seventh. Ottoman Empire is eighth. We are number 15. You can actually come over here, down here. You can explore any country in the world right here. I can sort by rank. So Belgium is number nine. Netherlands is number 10. Sardinia is number 11. Sweden is number 12. Switzerland is number 13. Portugal is number 14. And there we are, number 15. You're... Military power, your industrial power, and your prestige will determine your rank. The higher all these are, the higher your rank is going to be, basically. Um, prestige is affected by your prestige techs, by events, by your performance in wars. Industrial power is basically employed craftsmen and clerks divided by 2,500 in the value of your foreign investments. So having lots of employed craftsmen, lots of employed clerks, foreign investments, good. Raises your industrial power. And then your military power is your military spending, the size of your military, your officers, and as well as your capital ships in your navy. So having a large army, having it well supplied, having good officers, and having capital ships will increase your military power. All those things are good. Ideally, you want to become a great power, because then you can do a lot of things in the world. Okay. And we're not a great power right now. We're, we aren't a great power right now, but once we get a little later on to the game, we'll talk a little bit more about great powers and what you can do as a great power. And finally, we're going to take a look at the military. By the way, we have what are called diplomatic points. If I want to come over here to, say, the United Kingdom and improve relations with him, it costs us diplomatic points. It'll cost us two of our three diplomatic points. It's kind of like, uh, imagine like spending monarch power to improve relations in Europa Universalis IV. You know, it's kind of the same thing. It's just, it's not a monarch power. It's just, just, just a points system. We gain 0 0.3 diplomatic points per month. Okay. We don't have any colonies. There, there are, there's, there's a thing called crises. We don't have any crises at the moment. You know, international disputes, you know, crises, you know, um, kind of pressing concerns of the world that might degenerate into a war. Those are crises. We'll deal with some of those a little later. We're, we're not a great power, so we don't have a sphere of influence, nor are we part of any sphere of influence. We're not a great power, so. Okay, military. We have one army right now. This is the Ejercito Imperial. We have a general, Baral de Tramadai. He's a really crappy general. Let's see if we can find somebody better. Um, generals are kind of actually the same as Europa Universalis Four generals. They have his pre prestige rank. The more they're experienced in war, the better the generals will be. They each have two different... Well, they have a personality and a background. So, our crappy general right now, he's cautious, which gives him defense, but lowers his speed. And his background is he's a politician, so... He's got some experience, but he's not a very good leader. So, morale goes down. Let's pick this guy. De Lajes. His background is he's a politician, so he's got some experience. But he's also romantic, <laughs> which means... We get morale plus 40%. <laughs> Sweet. So we have our navy, or we have our main army here in Rio de Janeiro. We are at war with the Rio Grande do Sul. Their troops are here, as you guys can see. And we can come over here to the military. So we can raise troops right now to join our military. What types of troops do we need? Let's take a look at our Ejercito Imperial. 
We've got 21,000 inventory, 9,000 cavalry. We have crossed the eight brigades right now. And we don't have any artillery, so we should probably build some artillery. Let's come over here. And we can raise two regiments of artillery. We have 11,000 soldiers, which is enough to support four brigades of artillery. We're going to build two more brigades. So let's do that. And we can come over here to the Rio de, uh, Rio de Janeiro. In the bottom left corner, we can actually select this province to be a rally point for our armies and for our navies. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Also, selecting a province will bring up the province view screen. It'll show you what this province produces, uh, the crime fighting rate. That's a baton right there, a little nightstick. Uh, if there's any militancy, it'll show you what the goods produced from this province are worth on the international market. So 41 pounds worth of coffee is what this 16 units of coffee is worth. There's a thing called a resource gathering operation or an RGO. Every province in the world produces something. In Rio de Janeiro, we produce coffee. There's 226,000 employees involved in this resource gathering operation of coffee. We're at 51% of our capacity for this RGO. This will kind of rise and fall as supply and demand, you know, does its thing. We have 256,000 adult males living in Rio de Janeiro. And obviously there's been no province migration this month or this day even. Actually, all these values are calculated by day. And then there's been 486 births in this province in the last day, I guess. Technically, and also show you the ideology, the workforce, and the culture of this province. So Rio de Janeiro is mostly Brazilian, but with some Afro-Brazilian, mostly conservative, and about 53% of the workforce are farmers, with about 34% slaves, which is crazy. One in three adult males in Rio de Janeiro is a slave. It's actually more than one in three. Holy shit. Okay. So, yeah, your military score. Are you your military? You have your leaders. You have generals and admirals. You can auto-assign and auto-create leaders. You can create generals. You can create animals yourself as well. You need a certain amount of leadership, though, for that. The more officers you have, the more leadership you produce. So, it's not necessarily the more leadership you have, the better your officers are. It's just the more there are. You can produce navies from here. We don't have a navy at the moment. Actually, we don't have any boats, so we might want to change that. And this is your supply throughput. All of your naval ports give you more force limit for your navies. Pretty similar to something like Europa Universalis 4. So, more navies, good. More ports, more navies, more ships, good. It's a good thing. Your, so your soldiers, the thing is with soldiers is there is no real explicit force limit for soldiers, but you have to have the manpower to build troops. So, right now we can support 11 brigades of artillery. Each brigade is 3,000 men, so we, could, we can have an army of 33,000. So, right now we're producing two artillery regiments, which will bring us up to 12 brigades, and we only have enough manpower to support 11. So we're going to have understrength regiments. So ideally, you would want to boost your military spending to get more soldiers into the army. Or, alternatively, if I wanted to, I can come over here to the military screen and I can mobilize. I can draft our poor strata our poor people into soldiers. Your farmers and your laborers will become conscript soldiers. Ideally, you don't ever want to mobilize. It's it's more of a last resort kind of thing. Ideally, you want your professional army to be enough manpower to fight your wars at any sort of given time. You don't really want to draft your soldiers because it really messes with your country. It really does. It just it hurts your resources. Apart from our standing army, our country can also, in the event of war, draw upon additional resources in the form of conscript levies. By ordering mobilization, our conscript armies will begin amassing at major population centers and begin preparations for full-out war. Yeah, it's... 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 um... it's... painful. So right now, I can mobilize 9 brigades, or 5.5% of our poor strata, into soldiers. This is affected by many different factors. Your draft laws, your national value will affect this, your war policy will affect this. Um, there is such a thing though, it's called production impact, is basically the lower your production impact, the less your economy is going to be affected by the mobilization of troops. The larger your production impact, the more of the burden mobilization will put on your economy. 
So if your production impact is really, really high, you can effectively bankrupt your country. No one's going to be making any money. There's no, there's no buying. There's no selling. Everybody's just off fighting a war somewhere, you know? So that's what mobilization can do. On the other hand, if your production impact is low, say, I don't know, maybe in a totalitarian regime, right? As you can, you can conscript every adult male in your population, but because you're so totalitarian, you're able to manage the production of resources better than say a laissez-faire capitalist economy. You know, you can't just draft everybody in a laissez-faire economy and expect everything to work out fine. But in a totalitarian regime, you may actually be able to do that. So production impact, it's important. Okay. So we've gotten through, we've gotten through all the major tabs. And this episode is right about 30 minutes. So we've gotten through all the major tabs. We haven't even paused yet. Here's the outliner here. Obviously it shows you Armies, rebel occupations, army construction, national foci, rally points, all sorts of good stuff. Then these are your message settings down here. These are your message settings. This will show you basically messages that come in from countries around you, important countries, allies, enemies, all sorts of stuff. You can actually right click on, on these categories here to get rid of these events. And you can also right click on countries to bring up a diplomacy screen of that country. So I can go to Peru. I can look up, well, what is Peru, right? There are... Uh, or this is like Peru, Bolivia. I can look up their civilized nation, presidential dictatorship. I can look at, say, South Peru. There are presidential dictatorship as well. Colombia is a republic right now. All sorts of stuff you can look at. So, in the next episode, we're going to actually unpause. And we're going to begin our campaign as the Empire of Brazil. Walking you through the early years of the game. So, I will see you guys in the next episode. Thank you so much for watching as always. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. I'll see you guys very soon. Thanks so much.